Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, Will and I are going to go into a deep conversation about ambition and what what are the factors around uh, what ambition is, what are the metrics, how do we talk about that from you know individual to collective to society to what gets in the way of ambition to uh, what's playful about ambition, what's stressful about ambition, all that good stuff. So that's what we're getting into, right, Will? Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a fun topic. There's a lot of different aspects of it. And uh I know for me personally it brings up uh a lot of different kinds of feelings. Um for sure. And I, I think that's common uh for people to feel a lot of different things about ambition and what does it mean to to have ambition or be an ambitious person or for people to you know, say you're ambitious or, or to, to feel ambitious yourself, feel your own ambition, what it brings up for people. Yeah. Well, let's dive in. What you want to get us started with something you want to pose a, our first question or topic? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think that, uh, the first, for me, the, the place to start is kind of like pros and cons or, uh, light and shadow maybe of a bit ambition and also the cultural context, you know, which, uh, I think is always interesting. The, the way that here in North America, in the U S we relate to ambition in a particular way, personal ambition, individual ambition versus, uh, where we're trying to go as a community, as a, um, as a country, um, as a species. You know, what, where, where are we trying to get to? Do we have goals? Well, why don't we kind of lay the foundation then of what defining what we're talking about, um, with ambition. So I think it's important to think of ambition in different areas of life. Um, I think in our, if we talk our culture, um, at least in maybe more Western hemisphere, but more, that's not probably true. I definitely think in America and there's definitely countries in the Eastern hemisphere too, that when you talk about ambition, often people think about career, uh, and professional goals. Uh, but that's not really what we're necessarily talking about today. We're talking about how an individual would perceive ambition in different areas of their life. Right. Right. Yeah. That's an important so, distinction. Yeah. Yeah. Values. Yeah, so, Cause you brought yeah. up culture and like cultural definitions of ambition, um, and being ambitious. Right. And so I think culturally often ambition, ambition gets defined through, uh, career metrics and maybe there's some other things, but, um, it seems like it, you, you often associate that, um, word uh, on on more of these um cultural levels and i i think that that's a pretty shallow and limited definition of ambition personally i think it shows up in career but it shows up in other areas of life also yeah absolutely i mean what what's important to you right can drive ambition in a particular area right it doesn't have to be career necessarily yeah. Yeah. So there's a, a wide range of areas of life. Mm-hmm. And I mean, we could list some, but it's somewhat arbitrary of how, you know, an individual could define these however they want. But obviously, there's career and there's family. You could say there's spiritual development, personal development, finances. There's, a, there's these different areas, right, of how we could define and look at where people could be ambitious and choose to pursue amb- ambitious goals, right? Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think as a, as a kid, uh, what felt safe to me was to, um, pursue, hmm, how would I put this? It felt, I felt more safe pursuing goals that were in my, where I felt like I was actually had some skill. And I could develop some success. 
Yeah. What, and what, what so, <laughs> yeah. So for me, it was uh, mainly academics and sports were the two main things. And so I would go, you know, uh, try to be the captain of the team or, um, you know, get the next merit badge or the next uh, rank in my Boy Scout troop or, you know, there were, uh, or get the, try to get the A on the, on the exam or um, doing things that probably from the outside looking in were ambitious, but they were also ways for me to feel safe in myself, um, feel secure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think as a child, I would, I mean, most outsiders looking in on me would probably say I was not an ambitious child. Uh, looking across areas of my life as a child, although, um, you know, I think that I probably was actually ahead of the curve and ambitious in my um, in my adeptness at computers, and uh, I think that that whatever, right? That's an ambition, right? So I, mm -hmm. I was somewhat ambitious in terms of adapting to computers coming online um, and understanding them and learning about them. And um, I was not as ambitious in school, although I was very bipolar in my ambition in school. So every other semester was like A, B, C, like A's one semester, B's one semester, C's and B's one semester, A's one semester. Hmm. So like my ambition, and we could talk about, I think it's going to be really cool to talk about well, what, what gets in the way of staying consistent in different things that you want to be ambitious around. Um, so I didn't have a lot of like external metrics and goals that you could look at and go like, oh, these, here's the, here's the metrics that could show that I was ambitious. You you did though. You had the A's and you had the Eagle Scouts and the you know, the trophies and yeah. like you could you could see your results and your ambition for sure from what I'm hearing about you know in your childhood, right? Well, I was you know I had a lot of different kinds of privilege in my life that allowed me to pursue those things. Uh, there were tremendous challenges, of course, inside the home that that I grew up in. I've talked about that before on the podcast, but. But I think that, uh, you know, the, the reasons, I guess what I want to share is that the reasons for my pursuit of excellence were part, partly because I like to compete, um, at a high level. I like to push myself to be as strong or as, as fast or as smart or as well-informed as I can be. Um, but there was also in the in childhood anyway there were there was a lot of fear that was driving my ambition as well it was mixed into that for me yeah and my my ambition so you know some people in my adulthood would say i was very ambitious in my 20s and other people would say looking in being like well not in my scale of ambition right and so i was very ambitious in personal and spiritual development in my 20s i mean that was real um, and I was somewhat ambitious in pursuing a graduate degree and, you know, opening mm -hmm. a private practice. And obviously that's quite ambitious in a certain way to open your own business and do these things. And, um, but then I got more in touch with the concept of ambition more in my late thirties and early forties, where I was like mm -hmm. unleashing, like allowing permission to be highly ambitious for me that came later uh than it sounds like for you um where i actually had to sort of work through some aspects of myself that was stopping me from aligning with the identity of being a highly ambitious mm -hmm. person that will pursue huge visions whether i succeed or fail mm -hmm. um that was a big process for me to undertake that and to commit to that. And, uh, so, so there was, you and I are a little different there, I think, cause you, mm. you sort of were taking on different, uh, ambitions than I took on for sure earlier on, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Life. Different, different paths, uh, yeah. for sure. And I wonder, 
you say you you arrived at it late. I, I know you had a lot of different elements of what you went through and you know what prepared you for unleashing the ambition that you have now in your life. I'm wondering if you would, you know, share some of the elements of what that process was like for you. I think that my, so I think it's, you know, I'm probably talking about here different areas of life, right? So in childhood, I think I was very scattered child. And so it's hard for me to even conceptualize with so much disorganized attachment patterning and so much scattered ADT, ADHD type persona that I had. And it's hard for me to really think about as a kid how to define my ambition in most areas of my life. But then in early adulthood, it comes online, I think, pretty quickly, in particularly in one to two areas, which was more like spiritual personal development. And also relationship. I think that I had a lot of ambition around having a good relationship. Um, mm. That that was important to me. Uh, so those came online. Uh, I think that, you know, by nature, I was inquisitive and uh, more of a philosopher. And so I think I put ambition behind that aspect of my personality. But what didn't fully come online, again, it took some ambition for me to go to graduate school and create a private practice. That was obviously ambitious. Um, But I think it was in my mid to late 30s. And I think it was really my work in the ayahuasca churches that I was a part of that kind of lit a fire inside of me of like, and I don't know, I'm just speaking, you know, free associating here, but I haven't thought about this before. But I think that in terms of when I really committed to being like, I'm going to go after the biggest vision inside of myself in my career, let's say, uh, specifically in the way I serve in the world, I'm going to just unleash that in the biggest way I can. And I'm actually going to achieve the visions where I'm going to die trying. Like that message started coming through, but it wasn't until my late 30s that that started coming through, that I'm going to achieve something some huge vision of myself or I'm not, I'm just going to die, but I'm going to keep trying. And I think that was my work in my ayahuasca churches in my mid thirties. And I think it came out of, for me, and I'll wrap up here. I think for me, unleashing that level of ambition and the commitment to it came out of, for myself, going into such challenging places in myself and realizing that life was short um, mm. and that it was so important to um, serve while I'm here. I think the second piece that came out of it was having a child. I think that was the next catapult. <laughs> it was like that work in my 30s in the medicine church um, again, which most people know I'm not a part of that anymore. It's not serving me right now. But then the second big catalyst was realizing we were going to have a child and that we wanted that. And I was like, well, now I have another reason. That's not just me. It's not even just like the world that I'm trying to serve. Like there's a person coming and I need to show up (laughs) for this person in the biggest way I can be. Right. Mm. Like I need to be my fullest expression here and demonstrate that to my child. Um, so kind of, I'll stop there. It's kind of like uh, setting an example of how free or how empowered a person can be in the pursuit of self-expression. Is that is that fair? That is that what you mean when you talk about as a as a father wanting to that's what I meant. I meant yeah, I mean about just um role modeling. It became important to me to role model to my child, to my future child, that I was willing to go after whatever expression was inside of me. Mm -hmm. Um, and that like, you know, that's a lot of work. I mean to really push oneself continually to get to the edge of that expression. Yeah. Um, 
and th- and that's ambition for me. It's like getting to the edge of that expression is ambition, mm. and that's a mm. lot of work. Um, and I had a lot of reasons not to do that previously in my life, like to to go a little slower, and hmm. you know. And so I think it was a combination of that. I think also being in a good partnership with my wife Emma, like I think that she actually helped challenge me through a lot of the things that were slowing me down in my ambition Mm. yeah Mm -hmm. so that was me i mean you asked me about you know how how does how did that rise through me i think those were some three pivotal factors there are others um and i think ultimately for myself not everyone operates this way actually but i think a lot of people do which is i had to find a vision that was so far beyond me and the needs of just myself that, you know, when I, when I sort of fully stepped into a global vision, then I had a reason I felt like Mm. to do whatever it took. Um, because there was, you know, a lot more impact if I succeeded. So I think that the more my vision got bigger in myself, the more I was willing to find the ambition to actually go after it. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Was yeah. that, I mean, I, so your ambition obviously changed over time too, because um, the ambition to create this company together um, is, required a way different level of ambition, right? Yeah. Anything previously in your life. Um, For sure. The hurdles and obstacles and challenges to to grow something like this. So I'm just curious about if you're aware of it, of different factors that led to the ambition for you to grow a company um, yeah. that's, serving, that's serving a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, the, the growth edge of, of leading an organization, you know, with, you know, dozens of, of people working with us, collaborating with us is, um, <clears throat> it's an intense growth edge to work every single day. And it's also incredibly inspiring. And so I feel, you know, deep, deep gratitude to, to get to come to work every day and, and bang out the difficult task of facing my own limitations as a leader and uh, falling down, you know, every single day and learning and growing and, and it 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 didn't um the ambition to start the institute really uh was born out of a whole process for me that involved uh it for me it also goes back to ayahuasca and my relationship with healing trauma in ayahuasca circles uh for many years and coming into facing myself in those dark nights of the soul, so to speak, um, especially as my first marriage was ending. And I considered for a while uh, abandoning Western medicine and becoming uh, an apprentice to the ayahuasca shaman that I worked with for so many years. And I was in conversations uh, with him to start that process. And in ceremonies, um, again and again, I sat with question, brought the question to the ceremony of, is this my path? You know, is this the next step for me? And what kept coming back was from, you could say it came from my own inner divinity, or some people would say it came from the medicine or, you know, from the universe or wherever it came from was this very definitive statement of no you uh, your destiny is different you you don't need we don't need you to be a shaman we want you to help bridge the world of a different approach to healing into western medicine and you're in a position to do that and it was like we the collective we need you to do that and uh 
and then in, in short sequence, I'll get to the end of this answer in a minute, very quickly here, but uh, in short sequence after receiving the message uh, in my spiritual path, I met Krista and uh, for the first time in my life had the kind of relationship that supported me to well, demanded of me is more like it, supported and challenged me to be uh, the fullest expression of who I can be in the world. And in parallel with those two experiences, uh, I was studying with John D. Martini and you know his work around empowerment and and values and the different areas of life helped me to understand that there were deeper gifts that lived inside of me that I hadn't given the world yet. And it connect it, it, it very much, it worked together with this message from ayahuasca that I needed to occupy a different space. So there was a, a different way I could show up and give gifts into the world. So it was a very um, explosive moment at a personal development retreat. Krista and I were at where the question from the leader was, what is the biggest gift you can give to the world? What's the biggest expression for the rest of your life? And I realized that I wanted to go global with my vision with you. And um, so here we are. Uh, so it, it definitely yeah. took uh, it took a lot of healing for me to shift my ambition out of a um, kind of go get the rewards of the culture and like, be a good boy and like get the things that people get who are safe inside. This is my psychology. It's like, I want to get the, the things that make me feel safe in the culture. And now it's more about pushing the envelope, as you said, of me giving myself as fully as I can. So, you know, when I lie down at the end of my life, I can say, you know, I, I gave, I left it all in the field. I gave everything I could give. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It sounds like for you is also multifaceted, but you sort of had a spiritual calling. You had a, you had deep personal work going on. You had relational work going on that mm -hmm. just sort of brought a new level inside of your ambition and how you wanted to give and be here and serve. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious too about what when I think about, you know, I've I've read a lot of memoirs, I've watched a lot of documentaries around people achieving the heights of what they imagined they could achieve in their respective fields, right? Mm -hmm. Watch things in politics and entertainment and sports and like I, I'm just I always get very curious around people have these visions for their lives that are large in the sense of what it would take to get there you know the amount of um commitment and growth and devotion and discipline and effort and you know what causes someone to 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 just keep plowing through to achieve those heights of what they have for their minds and their lives and so you know one thing i i think i've seen um, in myself, but in a lot of these things that I've watched and read is that it seems like, um, one is that I mentioned, which is it seems like people have a vision that's way beyond themselves. It's like there's the self and other, right? You have to have a big enough vision to have a big enough ambition to follow it. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so it seems like that's one factor. What I get curious about is, that I think there's a lot of people that walk around with a lot of ideas about what they want to go after in life, floating through their minds a lot all day long. And they don't take many steps toward those ideas. Uh, and they, they, or if they do, it's, you know, a very kind of trickle process. You know, when I was working with clients, you know, however many I saw, and there was many stories of like, I, I have all these thoughts in my head and desires and things, but I, I don't see me doing this and I can't seem to stay consistent or I can't 
go after them or there's reasons not to go after them. And so I've become very curious of like, well, what causes a person to just continually refine going after these things and, and continue getting more consistent going after these ideas and visions and inside of them. And mm. I've gotten curious about that. I don't know what your sense is about that. Yeah. I, I think that, uh, I'm also curious about it. I, I, uh, and not as much as you, but I, I have looked around to, to see, you know, how are other people relating to this? And I, I feel really inspired by people whose stories are more public around this, uh, to learn from. And I think that what I've noticed in my own kind of journey with this in my life is that I get more, I get more disciplined and more consistent when, uh, my ambition or my goals are fully aligned with this kind of soul imperative of, of the fullest expression of my being in the world. Uh, and I also, you know, you and I with a background of psychotherapy training have kind of a secret weapon in relating to our own psychologies where I can see, uh, that parts of myself are not on board with, uh, going bigger in my life. There are um, plenty of fears that come up around that, that I relate to every single day that, that can derail the consistency and the discipline that it takes to achieve big things. I'm glad you brought up psychology because um, kind of a nuance I think that's important to discuss is the difference between visions and fantasies, <laughs> visions for our life and fantasies about our life. Yeah. And, and then I think there's people who have visions for their life that are having trouble going after those visions. And they're struggling with that. But then there's also just the daily fantasies, right? That we'll never go after. And they're not even meant to go after. That's not the point of those thoughts. Mm. So, um, you know, we don't, we don't have ambition around our fantasies, typically. Um, some people play out their fantasies a lot. But we don't typically achieve much other than the same thing over and over. <laughs> you know, like addictive cycles or things. We don't typically uh -huh. grow something uh, through fantasies that are large. And um, and fantasies, so just differentiating here, when I say fantasies, I'm talking about the, the thought process, the more cognitive process of we have these, you know, daydreaming moments that give us relief, typically, from challenge we're feeling. Right. And and we sort of have a fantasy of something that would make our lives better than what's happening in our perception in the moment. To me, that's not a vision. And that's typically not, I don't think, the source of ambition personally from what I've seen and what I've, uh, you know, what I see myself, what I've learned from clients and from everything I've followed around individuals who've had large ambitions, it doesn't seem that it's much driven around the fantasies of relief uh, to, but sometimes it can be, but highly ambitious people tend to not be driven a lot by the fantasies of relief in the moment of what's challenging. I think the vision that carries ambition a long way is when we see something in the future that we already know is going to happen, that aligns with what you're saying are, are what's important to us and our values. Mm -hmm. And we, we just see the expression of it over time and we're going after it. And maybe we don't see it 20 years out, but maybe we see it six months or a year out, right? Or three years out of, we feel it, we could kind of see it. We, we, we know it can come true inside of us because it's a vision. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, the whole word vision is about actually seeing something um, that extends outward. So I believe that, you know, ambition is much more grounded and rooted in 
more much more likely to follow ambition and meet higher levels of uh, goals, you could say, in that ambitious process when we're in the visionary state in ourselves versus the fantasy state. Yeah, I think what comes to mind is the neurological differences between those two states, you know, the uh, kind of animal mind of, you know, using fantasy to escape from some kind of challenge, as you said, is more of a lower brain kind of, to be generalized, a lower brain kind of function versus uh, the more, I would say, more emotionally stable uh, front part of the brain that, you know, is more abstract and can hold uh, a bigger, uh, a bigger vision that is less, um, less personal, um, where our human potential can be embraced for, you know, generosity and, um, compassion. Um, and, I was uh, I was having a conversation with Adam Gazali from UCSF about these brain networks that are involved in everything that we do, of course, as humans. And we were talking about compassion, and he said something really interesting to me, which I think is relevant here about ambition, which is that he said compassion cannot exist without attention that compassion is determined by how much attention you can hold. And I think it's a really interesting way to think about mindfulness and presence and developing the muscle of kind of the gray matter or the front part of the brain that we're talking about, where another hallmark of fantasy versus vision is... uh, distraction and fragmentation of attention, right? So I think that's part of what you're talking about is like, you've got to, or most people have to, most people are not born with a lot of, um, or even taught in childhood, um, how to develop the muscle of attention very much, especially not now with digital childhoods and all the things. So Um, babies (laughs) yeah (laughs) exactly yeah ipad junior (laughs) so so it's it's just a it's an interesting thing to think about how this lower part of the brain actually uh uses less energy than the the visionary part of the brain visionary part of the brain is expensive to run the gray matter and all the layers and the interactions between neurons cost a lot of energy to run electric electric electrically versus uh lower level brain areas which are more reactive and impulsive yeah and if you're inefficient in running that energy you're going to burn out of it quickly right so it's easy to shift obviously from these different areas in the brain is into different mindsets right from visionary mindsets right into survival mindsets that include fantasy and obviously your surroundings affect that and your the systems you're a part of affect that and impact that and who you are where you grew up and uh what's around you and i think that's a good point though that um to me that movement in the brain right, of the cultivation of returning to visionary, the visionary experience in the brain. Uh, It's a practice. And it seems like in the highly ambitious people I've met, I've met quite a few now, that you would sort of label as highly ambitious, not just in career, but like these are people that um, are continually trying to once they've hit a plateau of achievement of the things they set out to do, they're now settling and then creating new plateau in their head. Right. And they're Mm -hmm. moving through. It's sort of like hiking the next peak Mm -hmm. and they're creating this new thing. And it's not the only way to live, obviously, but it's one way is 
kind of doing this mechanism. And um, it it seems like though that the people I've met are continually uh, entering growth oriented mindsets, uh, visionary oriented mindsets. Um, they're popping new visions about their life. They're setting strategies right. to go after them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they're in training. Mm-hmm. You now the wind happens and they're back in training the next day. Yeah. Um, right. So it's like yeah. we did this whole project. This happens for you and I here all the time in the institute and the clinic. Like we have some big project and mm-hmm. uh, we're trying to create a new uh, training something that people need and want and value and it's this huge push and it's it takes all this effort and then if it's successful at the end we're like wow that was wonderful and there's so many people that love this and then of course like within a few days we're back in like what's the next thing that people need um so it seems like there's some kind of way that as ambition takes more and more hold in a human being there's this returning to this vision of like, what is my vision for my life? Uh, What am I doing right now to be walking on that path? Uh, That, Mm. that, 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 that sort of doesn't have to consciously be worded that way in a person's head, but it's being demonstrated in a person's life on a day-to-day operational basis as people keep embracing ambition more. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned growth-oriented mindset because because I think that's also a really key element of developing sustained uh, visionary mindset is having uh, a willingness to take responsibility for your own limitations and tackle your own limitations as a project uh, that will serve the greater good. Uh, if you're strapped if you strap yourself to a big mission uh that's going to require years to build and um you know dozens or hundreds of collaborators to to see it through uh you can't you can't get anywhere at least i can't get anywhere in the mindset that i drop into when i'm super stressed of um other, you know, the, the idea that other things are beyond my control and holding me back. I have to get back in alignment as quickly as I can acknowledge the, the state that I'm in, bring the witnessing consciousness back and get back on track with how can I solve this problem? Where's my, uh, what kind of like, for example, for me, like earlier this year, it's like, Oh, I need to go back to therapy. I'm having a lot of uh, interpersonal limitations that are coming up for me in working with people all day. I got to go back to therapy or I need a, I need a coach for this, or I've got to get my fitness routines down so I can actually support this front of the brain place that I want to try to make my home address. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, move into a better neighborhood. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think as a process of as um, you create more in the world, you start to learn that you need to uh, have more self care and um, different tools to keep that engine operating efficiently, the, the mind, body, spirit engine. <laughs> um, it's, it's like there's more and more to relate to about where this, the, that's, that engine is going off the rails, right? It's like, as there's more and more complexity around you that you've sort of invited in through creating more, whatever area it is again in your life that you're getting very ambitious around, you keep inviting more complexity to bring order into. And so I think that that acts as the mirror of where the fine tuning has to keep happening to meet that new level of complexity uh, in your life. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that includes, you know, like the exercise and the nutrition and the, Mm -hmm. um, 
the the daily habits and um, all these things become more tangible. I think over time, as mm-hmm. more complexity comes in, of like, I see like I'm getting in my way here. Mm-hmm. I can't meet this new level that I had this vision of unless I adapt and take better yeah. care of myself. And right, absolutely. I was just, yeah. I mean reflecting as you were sharing about the the different things that are needed to adapt to the higher level of complexity for me the way i relate to that is you know throughout my life i liked exercise i enjoyed exercise i exercised pretty regularly but i was re- exercising for a completely different reason from why i exercise and how i exercise now you know, I was exercising then as kind of a coping strategy for stress. It was like I would get the endogenous opioids, I would feel great. And then within a couple of days, if I hadn't worked out, I would feel bad again. And then I would go do it again. Now it's more like if I don't have my shit together on every level, I'm holding back the expression of this beautiful vision that I see possible. Right. And, uh, it feels it feels bad to to be the limiting factor in the expression of the vision yeah uh, i think that you know i had that awareness in my early 20s around the vision i had then i think mm-hmm. one thing that happens for people too is they can get into comparison games around what they've achieved and that you know where they're at and if they, you know they can get in comparisons like i'm so far behind and, mm-hmm. and i think that that's a um is not a great way to approach ambition because you know when i think about my early 20s and when i say i wasn't as ambitious like and i said but there were still things i was going after i still was facing the same questions whatever mm-hmm. i was achieving in that moment in time when i was deciding to go to graduate school to be a therapist and then deciding to open a private practice and deciding to go find my 20 to 50 clients and then you know deciding whatever the next thing was deciding to find my wife and Mm -hmm. deciding to have a child and deciding to have a home Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. like it was um i was still facing these things we're talking about at the same level it's just relative right which is like i was facing inefficiency in a lot of ways that were um i needed to address in order to achieve those things Mm -hmm. i needed to address on some level i had such severe adhd i needed to address on some level that when i went to grad school although i probably could have addressed it a lot more but i needed to address it on some level to get through grad school um, right and do well and uh, i did that through trauma work I didn't know I was doing it directly through trauma work, but it was. So I think that it's, it's, you know, this is all relative and people get in these sort of comparison cycles of where they're at and what level, you mm. know, and then it's like anything I've achieved now, certain people will talk to me and they, they I've heard, I've actually seen it happen. They go into shame, but like, I don't even, I'm like not even thinking about what I've achieved now as that ambitious. I'm looking at the other thing in the future that I haven't achieved as ambitious, right? So I think that that's one thing is uh, part of the work is neutralizing like and and embracing like the level we're at took something. It took a lot of us to get to where we are, wherever we are. It took so much. And then can we embrace the journey of what do I need to do right now to bring more order into the complexity I've invited in right. to invite in the next level. Yeah. And I think there's also this trap. It's similar to what you're saying about comparing um, and feeling like you're behind, but there's also this trap that I've experienced a lot in my ambition of not so not taking the time you were talking about a few minutes ago, like, okay, we, we did that. We took on that big project and we completed that. And I think that for ambitious people, I think it's easy to forget how important it is to, uh, celebrate the, the accomplishments that come with working hard and getting, um, getting somewhere in whatever domain, you know, and, and to your point about, um, 
comparing. The other thing I think is really interesting is to take uh, we were you and I were talking about this right before we got on here about you know take take control of who is defining ambition you know rather than having comparison by default you know make the definition of ambition right oh so and so did that and therefore I'm less versus like. What does it look like? This is maybe this is sort of a call to action at the end of this conversation as, as we wind down is like, what is your definition, right, of success or, or ambition inside of your own priorities? Totally. I think that is a great call to action. Just first answering for yourself, what are you actually prioritizing right now in your life? And what is your vision in the near future for your life? Right. And um, has it been a recurring thing you haven't been really able to achieve? Mm -hmm. Has it been in your head for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? A lot of people have that. Right. And that's okay. But then it's like, if that's really feels like a vision, if you really see that coming true, it's then I think it's, I think a good call to action is just like, well, well, why haven't you achieved it? What's the real reason? Right. What's, what's stopping you? from getting more ordered and bringing in more order into a strategy to get there. Right. Right. Exactly. And what kind of resources internal and external inside of you and around you that you don't currently have a lot of access to that would turn this vision into a plan, you know, to get right. on the road toward manifesting the vision. Um, right. I certainly lacked internal and external resources in uh earlier in my life that um have you know come i have so much gratitude for 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 the journey and learning about how to bring those resources home to support the manifestation of the vision you know right yeah, I think that's good too. And some people who have limited external resources, then then it's the next kind of call to action is, well, what else would support you mm -hmm. in this journey? Is there something else that can help you get to the next bit part? Yeah. The vision, right? Yeah. And, and one particularly powerful lever for me uh, is relationship. And mm -hmm. I'm talking about accountability and, you know, like the way you and I support and challenge each other, the way Krista at home challenges me every day to look at um, how aligned am I in where I'm going. And if I'm out of alignment, you know, I, I hear about it <laughs> right away. And we have that agreement with each other. So that, that to me, that social um, accountability is incredibly powerful for me. Yeah. Yeah, I think for me coming through this conversation, as we are wrapping up, there's, there's a few highlights that we're going over here. I, I think one is to, first of all, embrace your genius that's already brought you to where you are. Yeah. And doing an inventory of what it took, no matter where you are in this life, of what it took to get to where you are and what you've already achieved. Mm. Um, you know, just being alive is an achievement. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a big true. one, actually. That's for sure. It's a massive achievement. So um, there's a lot of, I think that's the first piece is really loving what you've achieved. That's the celebration you're talking about. Um, cause if you can love the achievement you've already created, you're way more likely to achieve something, uh, mm -hmm. at another level. I think it's very hard to achieve the next level when you actually hate the achievements you've had your whole life. <laughs> and that's, then you're in more of a fantasy of like, well, someday I'll have an achievement I actually love. Right. Um, so that's like the first thing is I think doing the inventory of what have you achieved? What can you stand behind and say, I did achieve this. Uh, and and owning that and embracing that and looking at the genius in yourself that got you there, right? I think that's a that's a critical piece. It's huge. Um, yeah. 
And there's many others too that we're talking about here today to, to, um, I think a strategy that's aligned with your, what's important to you, making sure you're in a vision versus a fantasy, Mm -hmm. um, and just doing the work to, you know, distinguish between the two, noticing if there's a lot of comparison or fear in the desires, um, Mm -hmm. that's typically that lower brain state to Mm -hmm. put it kind of simply and noticing if there's a lot of inspiration and light and feeling like it's going to come true in the visionary state and, and then setting out these strategies to go after the visionary state and organizing our days and around these states. And I, 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 I really believe that when we do this, these visions are bound to happen for every individual, that next level that's popping in the front of the brain that we see, uh, it, it, it's coming true if we can believe in it enough and actually put some behavior behind it. I mean, if we can't put behavior behind it, it's mostly the law of attraction. I don't know, but I don't, I don't think it's enough personally. Yeah. I mean, a little bit of social accountability goes a long way for me and yeah. c- cementing the behaviors uh, into place. And and so that's what I want to also add at the end here as we conclude is find someone who you can trust. If you don't know someone you can trust about this, that's okay. And go find someone, find a new person who also is uh, going to set goals that you can help them uh, stay on track with them. So it's a, it's a fair and symmetrical exchange of care, really, to challenge each other to stay on track, um, support each other when you fall off the rails, and you, you know, go down some blind alley. And you know, it's super helpful to have someone who cares about you to tap you on the shoulder and say, Hey, uh, where'd you go? Um, totally. <laughs> well, I'm glad you said social, because another one, which we didn't talk about, I want to add in is to find people you can hang around that not out of comparison, mm-hmm. but to learn from that have achieved the next thing you're trying to achieve and try mm-hmm. to find them and hang around them. And that could be in any area of life. Again, it could be in mm-hmm. family or parenting, or um, right. it could be in finances and money, and it could be in career and it could be in all these different areas, right? It could be in personal development, but find people that clearly have achieved the next thing and hang around them a lot because they'll be operating, their whole organism will be operating in the level that your vision mm. uh, is is predicting for yourself. And their form is going to be different. And that's why you don't want to compare yourself to them. Um, mm. But I think that's another important piece is trying to meet and hang around people that you see and you go, oh, that's, I see characteristics there of the next thing I'm trying to achieve. Yeah. 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 I think that's good to wrap up there. Those are four yeah. good four good takeaways, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's been until fun. To talk our, about. Until our next ambitious podcast. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Check back in in a while on ambition. Check, check back in. <laughs> Bye. Bye.